So ladies and gentlemen, let's start with our first speech. And uh, our first speaker is head designer at IKEA. Born in Sweden, his story is pretty much linked to IKEA, and you're going to understand why. He had different positions by IKEA, like communication and interior design manager in Swedish stores, global range strategist and marketing manager retail for IKEA Sweden. But then in 2000, he founded his own retail agency named Colo, and in 2012, he got back to his first love, which is IKEA, and he's today head of design. Please welcome Marcus Engman. Thank you. So, hi guys. Pleased to be here at this great school. So I'm here to talk about um, something we call, yeah, let's see if it works. Democratic design today. And uh, you know what? We um, come from a very small place, this place, Elmult. So, how do you get things going for the future if you want to talk about the future of living, the future of the home? If you come from a place with only 10,000 inhabitants, that's where I was brought up, you know, 10,000 people. That's not a lot, is it? I think that we're a very, very, you know, strange company. We're super curious. We were founded by a super curious person. And if you come from a small place, you have the choice of going into gymnastics or being curious and go to creative parts. I wouldn't say that gymnastics is not, uh, you know, creative, but it's creative in a different way. So what we have done is, you know, you know get a lot of people into a line of thinking together on something that we want to change. I would say also, when I describe IKEA, you know, IKEA is like, we're a super big company. How do you trust a super big company? You just want to earn money. The way that we earn money within IKEA is very different. Our approach is not focusing on businesses. We get business when we do the right stuff. And the right stuff for us is actually to fulfill our vision. So we're a vision-driven company. And this is what I would like to share with you, actually. How we do this thing, how do we fulfill our vision, how do we do it every day? How do we work with this? Some examples of that, to set the stage for all of the great speeches you're going to hear of the future of tomorrow from all of the other speakers. So this is like the IKEA way. We want to create a better every life for the many people. That's the way that we do our business. If we do that right, if we get those solutions, we get great sales. If we focus on sales, we're just another company, like everybody else. So actually, what we want to do is to change the world. If you want to change the world, maybe it's not just good to focus on making stuff. And it's good to hear that here's like a lot of students here trained for design for the future. A part of that training is to make great stuff. But what we really want to do is to make things better, isn't it? through stuff from time to time, or through new ways. That's what we want to do, too. And to be able to do that, we have uh, this small formula, which we call democratic design at IKEA. And uh, that's how we make things better. I want, you to t I want to take you through you know, how we work a little bit with this on a daily manner. So uh, one of the things, if we take on democratic, first of all, What's so democratic about democratic design? It's the involvement of people in both how we do the stuff and how we do it within IKEA, how we do it together with people on the outside. It's really important for us to be inclusive, not exclusive. The democracy part is actually to share good ideas with a lot of people. And I think this is one of the problems that we have today. There are so many good ideas. But are we willing to share them with everybody? From time to time, I think that we keep our ideas to ourselves. And that's not the IKEA way. We want to share with as many as possible. That's the democracy part there. Now we get, want to get more people into how we do stuff also together. So it's not just to share the ideas when they're ready, but actually to do the ideas together. We're opening up boot camps, we co-create, we do a lot of that stuff. I'm going to share that. So, actually, I hear again that you could hear more of my beer than you hear me, actually. <laughs> uh, 
that uh, the way that we work, working with design at IKEA, you know, it's not just about the designers. It's actually how we work together. What you see here, it's our staircase in our headquarters in Elmelt. Uh, what we do there is like 4,000 square meters of open space. You can see all of our projects there, totally transparent from the very beginning. Start off with a post-it, ending off in real products. Everybody could see it, even the visitors coming into our space. It's a sharing way of working. And there is always specialists, there are product developers, there's engineers, and then there's designers. But doing design is not just for designers. We have to be more people involved. So, as a company then, you have to be really curious about people. That's number one. We're super curious about people. How do we do it? Of course. Hello, Sorry. My name is Moet, and I'm here to show you my crib. All right, round two. This is my room. That's my bed. It's pretty practical because you can stuff things underneath it. I'm spending a lot of time at home writing and reading. We have so many books. Most of the books here, yeah, they are choked off. So I need a bigger one so that it can contain more books. My favorite chair, where I spend 10 hours a day. Microwave oven, important. This is a very well designed bed and couch. And the same issue over there, bed and couch. I have two beds, just in case someone is visiting me and I wanted to make them feel comfortable. This is my room, this is my bed, this is where I study, this is my closet. And this is my mirror. And this is Freya. Hi, Freya. Hi. This is where I'm working. No furniture. You can see my bed. It's on the floor. What I really mix? The dining table. One day I think I'm achieving. Postcards and pictures from my friends and family it really makes me feel like I'm at home. For the last part, my favorite part of my room, which is my windowsill, where I can sit down and relax and read by the light of And now, the best part of my one room nirvana is this. Recreational spot that I've created for me and my friends where we just sit, talk, and share ideas. Man. This is why I bought this one room nirvana. Ciao. It's really nice people, isn't it? So I'll just flip it through, but the way that we do stuff, you know, how do we relate to people is through home visits. We do thousands of them every year. We are a lot of people employed at IKEA, so it's not just a few doing this, it's not just a research department, it's actually everybody working at IKEA, both the us product developers and the people out in retail. That's how we get learnings. That's also how we get one-to-one -one talks and relations with people out there. Most of our ideas origins from actually problems that we find in those discussions. That's how we take it on. Uh, you know, since I've been working with interior decoration, I think it's kind of, a, it's from time to time when you see this, you could get super depressed also, you know. <laughs> but everybody is so content with their homes, and I think that there's something lovely about that. And it's also embracing the differences within people. You can't design life, you know, but you could help people lead a better life. So, then, of course, on top of those home visits, we have this big research department, like any other big company. We get some learnings. What we have done lately there is, you know, if we invest all of this in getting smarter within IKEA, what's the best use of it? Let's put it out there. So instead of keeping it to ourselves, we're actually putting all of our research out for everybody to use. Because we don't think that we could solve all of the problems by ourselves. We need you guys to do it together with us. So if you want to, you could go into this lifeathome.ikea.com and get the research, you know, everything that we have around our home visits and things like that. It's actually uh, the latest one, which is from eight different big cities, visits there. We uh, took on uh, the topic of uh, what actually makes a home, you know, going back to that. If you ask people what's important to people, what is the thing that makes a home today? Got some uh, pretty interesting stuff out of that, as I saw. 
Oops, this flipper is really hard. One of the things you saw in the, uh, in the movies before we came up on stage here is this thing about the use of technology in the home. We have never been so connected and had so many possibilities to communicate. Still, maybe this is the loneliest of times. And this is what people say. And there, there again, you know, the home becomes really, really important. How could we cater for real relationships and real talks, not through screens, but actually hands-on? Because it's important. We actually saw that in uh, Shanghai, for instance, 49% uh, thought that it was more important to have good Wi-Fi than to have social spaces at home. It's scary, isn't it? You know, I, was, I was actually trying to book uh, hotel rooms for me and my, um, my family, and uh, the first thing my daughters asked me was about the Wi-Fi. They didn't even ask me where we were going, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're going to Reykjavik. Yeah, who cares? What, what about the Wi-Fi? <laughs> the other part, which I think is really interesting, this is also, I think, for us, it opens up for us a lot, is how do you, uh, what do you consider your home? What we at IKEA has looked upon as the home before we did this was actually the four walls. You know, what happens between, within those four walls of an apartment or a house? That was good enough for us to solve that. That's a big problem enough. But when we ask people what they consider being their home nowadays, it's their neighborhood. In big cities, it's not just the home. The home is getting smaller and smaller. Then the neighborhood becomes more and more important to people. Oh, shit. And they have to do something about this one. So, uh, actually, 41% feel more at home outside their actual residence. There is some kind of revival for the neighborhood. And personally, I think that's a really good thing. But how could we cater for that as a company? And how do we get research, you know, so we become smarter about that? Maybe it's not good enough to do home visits anymore. We thought of a new idea, actually. Maybe IKEA is not just about getting people to come to IKEA and experience IKEA. Maybe we have to go out there and do live visits instead, because it's not good enough with just knowing what happens in the home and talk about that. So we actually made an excursion a couple of weeks ago uh, into this. I think this, to us, actually, was a really new way of working. You know, coming out to people. This is a music, food and art festival in Copenhagen. It was the first time it was run. We had the possibility to try out new stuff there. You saw that, you know, IKEA Music Lab. Yeah, we're going into music. That's kind of nice. Uh, food. Yeah, we did a food lab. Why? Because we saw from our research and our meetings of people that what makes a home is very much connected to emotional stuff, not just functional stuff. We've been a company who's been focusing on solving functional problems for a lot of times, and we've been fairly good at that. But if the most important part for people, for the home, is actually emotional needs, how do we solve that in a better way? It's not just home furnishing and how you style things together. It's other stuff, too, that we have to cater for. That's why we go into music, because music is one of the most important ways of actually making a home for young people. Food is the most important thing if you want to socialize. Then, to be able to get more knowledge, we went out there, where they did this food lab, 
actually experienced with a new way of, of doing like super fast infusing uh, through vacuum. Uh, and that turned out really, really nice. That's the thing that you saw though, in those plastic bags and synthesizers and stuff. So yeah, pretty cool stuff coming up there. Oops. The other part of democratic design, if we talk about democracy then, to get everybody involved and how we involve with people, the other part is how do we do the design? And Simona was talking about it a little bit before. I think it's really important to us. We have five pillars for everything we do within IKEA that is important to us to, to fulfill in all of our products. It has to have a form, which is beautiful. It has to be functional for everyday use. It has to have a quality, which is long-lasting and something which ages in a beautiful way. It has to be done in a sustainable way, both for people and the planet. It also, for the future, maybe has to nudge people into a more sustainable behavior. So it's not just about IKEA being sustainable, but could we cater for a sustainable behavior from our customers? Because IKEA, we're, at the end of the day, we're like 180,000 people. But we have 2 billion customers. So if we could change the behaviors of 2 billion customers, that's a big change to the world. Then low prices. Yeah, we talk about low prices, but what it really is, is accessibility to ideas. And we have learned through 70 years or so that low prices is the major or the prices is the major threshold for people to buy great design and to get a hold of good ideas. That's why we focus so much on low prices. That's why it's so hard to make things at IKEA. That's why, you know, we have to design every single piece from scratch and that it takes three years to do something that looks fairly simple. Some facts and figures, maybe, huh? Since we're a big company, I want to share that with you. That's good. You know what this is? This is the number of a big responsibility. It's almost four billion things that we produce, design, and sell all over the world every year. Four billion things. That's a big responsibility to do it right. <sighs> I hate this. This number, 1,000, you know, to do 4 billion things, is just 1,000 suppliers that we have at IKEA. That's not very much to do 4 billion things. And the good thing, you know, if you want to do big changes and if you really want to dig into and, and, and not just tweaking things, then you, you need to... Uh, <laughs> this is like crazy. Uh, then you need to have long-term relationships. Because this is not something that you could go out and buy and then, you know, change it. So those thousand suppliers we have had for 11 years or more. That's a long relationship. And that's what's, need, what's needed to actually make the change. This small number then. This is the amount of designers we have at IKEA employed, 20 all in all. That's not very much. This is the number of years that most of the designers have worked, 15 years. So most of our designers are actually senior designers because it takes time to learn this way of working at IKEA. And we need this kind of seniority to solve those big problems. And the designers, as I said before, is just part of a team. They're not all. They're part of the team of specialists to solve the problems of the future. 2,000. We had 4 billion things. 2,000 news is what we do every year. 2,000 new projects <laughs> from Elmult, this small place of 10,000 people. So 2,000 possibilities to change things to the better. How we do it, there's no secret sauce to it at all. It's actually keeping, you know, focus on every single piece that we do and go through it, go through it again and change and change and change until it becomes really great. So there is no secrets, it's just hard work. It's simple as that. Sorry to say. Uh, what I would like to do now just to, you, is to go through maybe two examples. And actually, I think that you're going to get this. We're, 
talk about democratic design. We have produced a book. I think you're going to get it today. Uh, it's uh, containing 12 different stories of how we do democratic design. It's 11 good ones and one fiasco. Because I think it's important to embrace fiascos also at IKEA and in the world in general. Because it's from the fiascos you learn. And we love it at IKEA. You know, every time we do a fiasco, we celebrate. <laughs> so uh, maybe we should start with a fiasco, huh? <laughs> this is one of my favorites. You know, I, I, I was away from IKEA uh, for uh, 12 years. Just before that, I had the opportunity to do uh, one of the biggest fiascos of IKEA. So uh, let's share that. Uh, it was uh, the perfect crime, we thought. We came up with the idea. Uh, you know, we love flat pack. You know, it's one of the ways that we create our low prices at IKEA. To get things flat and to be good at logistics is also one of the ways that we create truly good sustainability because we don't like sending air. So someone came up with you, and, and one, one of the, uh, the, the parts of our range, which we have had a really hard time to flat pack for years and years, has been the upholstery range. You know, sofas, they're really hard to flat pack. Beds too. So they didn't really fit in into the IKEA way of thinking. So uh, when this idea came up, you know, the perfect crime, getting paid for nothing, what about selling air? What about doing inflatable sofas and upholstery for the future? We started up that project. We put a lot of resources into it. Uh, we thought we were super smart. And uh, we were, in one sense. It's 85% uh, less material in this sofa that you see here. It's 90% uh, more flat pack. So from that sense, it was good. But if we would have had democratic design, the principles of democratic design when we did this idea at the time, which was in the 90s, I think we would never have made those, made those mistakes that led to this sofa. So let me take you through it, you know, if you want to you know, rethink that sofa. So let's start with uh, maybe the sustainability factor of it. The sustainability factor was absolutely great. We invented a new plastic, a far more sustainable plastic, just to be able to do this sofa. We also you know, catered for flatter, so less things uh, which is um, transported all around the world. That's good too, for sustainability reasons. So you could tick off the sustainability part. When it came to um, the uh, low price, it was a little bit expensive for most people. But it was not that expensive. That was not the biggest problem. Uh, when it came to, um, to uh, function then, let's talk about that. You were able to sit it in. It was actually quite comfortable for a couple of days. <laughs> then we had this huge problem with uh, the quality, which is closely connected to function and also to the form of it, which was actually, it leaked air, you know, after a while. And we went into that. What's the problem with that? Yeah, we said that people should fill this, the, these containers of air with their hair dryers. We thought that was like a brilliant idea. So uh, people were doing that. And we tried it out in our test labs and everything. It worked out great. What we didn't think of, what we didn't try, was that most people, you know, when you blow your hair, most people blow it with hot air. It didn't work out with the plastic. So it actually melted parts of the plastic. So that was the starting point for you know, the leakage of air and the quality perception of the sofa and the function of the sofa. The other part from terms of, of function of it was uh, uh, actually when you sat in it, there was different containers of air there. You could hear like a crazy sound going on, like <laughs> as soon as you moved. It was like sheep film productions or something. And then the other part, which was actually uh, Quite good, too, if you look upon it from this perspective. This is like the uh, emancipated Swedish men. <laughs> uh, uh, was that it was, of course, easy to clean. You could just lift the sofa, you know, it was super. But it was, had the drawback, too. And that was that, it, you know, when you sat in it, and most people don't want to have the sofas pushed to the walls, 
it was floating around, you know. <laughs> we talk about the fluid home nowadays, but we didn't want it to be that fluid. So it was hard to relate to from a functional point of view. And then on top of that, you know, we did, we made it look really quirky. So we made it hard for people to adapt to something which, which was really new and good. So if we were, would have walked this idea through the five pillars of democratic design, we would have rethought it in a different way. And right now, we're actually looking into doing new inflatable furniture for the future. So, you know, don't give up on a fiasco. It's just a starting point of something new. So, that's a fiasco. The second story that I wanted to share with you is actually how we work with democratic design and how we start off with our low prices at IKEA as a way of solving problems. Actually, one of the greatest ideas uh, for the last 50 years, I think, that is affecting us in home furnishing is the LED. When we started off with LED at IKEA, uh, the cost for the LED bulb was like maybe 15 euros, and it didn't take off. Not at IKEA, not on the market, but still it was a truly great light source that saved like 80% of the energy. So are we content with that, or could we do something about it? Then uh, our dear founder, Mr. Ingvar himself, you know, he had looked upon this LED, and it's, since he is this curious person, he thought, uh, well, this, is, this is a truly great idea, I want to do something about it. Uh, let's put up a challenge. The challenge was actually to do a one euro bulb, because we saw at that price point, this good idea would spread to all of the world, instead of just for a few. Then you have to rethink, 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 and rethink again. And, uh, you know, we all, this, this, this is the product developer of this project. And uh, you can see that she was quite annoyed during the times. <laughs> and she, she tried to present it, like, I think, five or, or six times in, in business councils and, and uh, these design freezes and so on. But she was never up to par with one euro. Almost one euro, but almost is not good enough. We wanted to reach that good part. And what I think, you know, the solution was very different. From time to time, you think that, oh, it's all about purchasing power. You could get down the prices by just doing volumes. But we tried that, but that didn't succeed. We tried also to, you know, go for cheaper components. Didn't succeed either. Then somebody smart rethought it. And if you really look through those things here on the, on the left side, you could see that it's actually less components. So we had engineers looking into those components that were on the market, and then they found that there are some new ones coming up, which actually could do more, but they're a little bit more expensive. But if we put them in, better quality stuff, but less of those, we end up on a better price level. And I think this is a good story. And this is the way that we achieved to do this, Riyadh actually at 0.99 all over the world, which is a truly great price. That makes also a way for us at IKEA to nudge people all around the world into a more sustainable behavior. So using design in that sense, I think, is great. And that's just through pricing, actually, and being smart about that. There's more stories than that. You don't have to read books if you don't like that. Some of you guys want to be online instead. Every day, we post how we work at IKEA on IKEA.today. And uh, this is straight from the source. It's our product development center in Elmelt. Uh, we share our travels. We share our thoughts around things. We want to interact with people through this page also. So this is a good thing if you're interested in IKEA to have a look upon. There is constantly a constant flow of new ideas there. I don't, wouldn't say that they're all good. There's a lot of uh, possible fiascos too. And as we say that in IKEA, then, most things still remains to be done. We're never content in this company. What do you think is on our mind right now? A lot, I can tell you. Uh, one of the things, we had a workshop yesterday, which is about the population, the growing population of older people all around the world, that puts up new possibilities and restraints on actually functionality of goods. 
Could we design for that? Could we cater for that in a better way? Could we do like plates and cutlery that works for people in a better way? And not just for older people, but for old people. And maybe to rethink the way that those things are done before also, because most of it has very specific aesthetics. Because people think that you want to have some kind of aesthetics when you grow older. So I'm going to go all beige on you when I turn 65. It's not like that anymore. So could we do things that caters for everybody instead, but with greater functionality? That's one of the projects that we look at. Yes. The other part what is this, I actually. Yeah, smell like. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> like furniture. <laughs> like fresh new home. It smells very good. It smells like flowers. Very uh, refreshing. I don't know. I have never thought of it, but very clean. Is there, is there a smell in IKEA? Sometimes it smells like uh, fresh uh, more cut wood. It smells like the nature is right in front of you. IKEA smells like the Schutzbella. Swedish meatballs. Oh, we do a lot of meatballs at IKEA. Every time when I go there and I go to the wood section, it's, I really like that smell. It reminds me of child. Yeah, scents, of course, is really, really interesting. And fragrances in your home. You know, can't you do more than just uh, candles and sticks? Because fragrances and scents is so connected to memories. Memories is connected to homes. So we're investigating what scents could be for the future, for the home. The other part is taking on space. We work with space centers right now in the United States to see how we could reinvent small space living from that. And this is the way of thinking, take on the very hardest parts and see if we could learn from that. So we're actually doing like a Mars habitat uh, and uh, you know, putting IKEA things inside of that. Maybe we, may, we might not send it to Mars, we don't know, but uh, it's a good starting point for us to learn how to do small space living for the future because it puts up really, really high standards on what to solve. But there are bigger problems than that, and maybe more urgent things that we could see that we want to, you know, tap into. And the last thing that we're looking into right now, a big thing, is off the grid. I guess you all have seen what is happening around the world right now, uh, with storms and earthquakes and so on, and it's affecting very much urban areas. We talk about urban areas as the areas where everything is working. But there is a bigger and bigger need for having interdependency within urban areas for the future, to be able to be off the grid. That's one part. Another part is actually people who choose to be off the grid. I don't want to be part of it anymore for different reasons. How could we cater for that? I don't want to be part of, of the sewer system or the water system or the internet. So what we're looking into is actually both communication, water, and energy in new ways. And why? First of all, it's two billion people without energy today. And as I said before, there's a lot of people who choose not to be part of it. Our way of thinking here is typically IKEA, I would say, and it's really, really hard. It's like a, a Tingy Lee, you know, the guy here in Switzerland, Switzerland, I guess. You know, everybody's going digital. And when everybody's going one way, we at IKEA like to try out the other way, just to see if the other way works. Otherwise, we will be one of the many. Of course, we're going to do digital stuff too. But could we take this on from a more like, I wouldn't say conservative, but low-tech way to do solutions? So uh, investigating things like storing energy, like you did here in Switzerland in clocks, uh, in, uh, uh, actually mechanically. We've done lights here, they're in a very early phase, which is, you know, lighted up totally mechanically, like old clocks, interdependent of everything. And quite beautiful too, I think. This is uh, Mikael Axelsson, our own internal designer. Okay, talk is cheap, work is hard. I think that we have to do this together. And um, this is what we have started. We're actually going on to do off the grid together with people. We have started on like a world tour. And uh, it's workshops going on all 
through Europe and parts of Asia and parts of the United States during the year to come, uh, just to get ideas together. And then we're going to put this up in a new collection, which is the off-the-grid collection that uh, hopefully we will be able to present next year on Democratic Design Day. So I think it's pretty cool, actually, to co-create, to work together, to reach out. Here's some of the ideas here. You know, sometimes when you have workshops, it's uh, good ideas and there's less good ideas. This is from yesterday. This is like harvesting energy from, from out of the uh, keyboard. Uh, and some other pod ideas there. This is a mechanical toothbrush. <laughs> I, I think it's kind of a sweet design to it, too. Uh, and this is actually something that we could do any day, which is a, a drawer unit. If you want to have light inside of your drawers, or so it actually kinetically it creates the, uh, the uh, energy. So it works with LED. wouldn't work in the older days. Oh, here's a strange one. This is a composting material and then creates warmth and energy from out of that. Okay, we can't make this happen on our own. We have to make it together with you guys, and it's time to do that, so thanks a lot. Come with me, Marcus. Thank you very much, Marcus. Let's go on the sofa. I have a question. Listening to you, it appeared to me that it's very much sounding like a fairy tale at IKEA. I mean, you're making a better world, you're working all together. Is it really like that? I mean, it's a good marketing concept, but is it really like that? No, the truth is that it is an everyday struggle. <laughs> no, but you, you, like to, you, you have to love problem solving if you work at IKEA, because there's a lot of problem solving going on every day. So, and those are struggles, but I think that the, you know, being able to solve some of those problems from time to time, th those eureka moments that you have from time to time, that makes it worth it. We have understood that uh, you've been through problematic phases and chaos, and out of chaos come the good ideas. So this is actually necessary to go through chaos. Yeah, I think so. I think that actually our way of working, we call it the fun funnel. You have to start with a lot of ideas to, to end up with something which is good at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could call that the struggle too. But at IKEA, we have chosen to call it the fun funnel. So I think it's how you put wordings on things also and okay, how you so look upon it. Okay, so it's a question of point of view, that's what you're saying. Yeah. All right. And um, I had another question also, because the thematic of today is uh, the future of living at home, but what appeared to me is, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's more like living outside of home, and the home is going to be all of it, outside, inside, and the mix of it. So that's how you see it at IKEA. I think we're going to see far more mixes of, of ways of living. We can see that happening already. You can talk to architects about this also too. Uh, and, and that is people who just are inside of the cities in parts of the week and work there, and then they live outside. So you have like two homes. And how do you make up that, that home which is just for some hours? Uh, how do you make that homey? It's a new, you know, something that we have to solve that we haven't thought of. And mm -hmm. then you have the other home. Uh, then it's this neighborhood thing also, which is, right. I think, is a, that you care for each other in a, in a bigger respect than just the things that is happening inside of the four walls. So it's actually a global point of view, more than like precise. Uh, what we see, which is the good part, I think, that everybody's focusing on differences. When you come out, to, when you are fortunate, as we are to some of us, to, to travel the world and, and to see different places, uh, everybody considers themselves to be really unique and everything is so specific there. Right. But what you see is actually going around that there is more similarities than differences between, mm -hmm. between countries and between cities all over the world. Right. So I'd like to know if there are some people in the room who would like to ask some questions. I see a hand over there. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for your inspiring presentation, Marcus. Um, I have a question about the evolution of workspace because we spend all a lot of time also at work. So how do you see that in IKEA? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, uh, I, we believe that it's, it's, it's one of those things that we're putting a lot of efforts in right now. And uh, in the typical manner of IKEA, you know, we have gone out to different workspaces, but we're also fortunate enough to, to uh, right now, we're changing our own workspaces. So we start up with ourselves. What would be like 
a good workspace environment that we would like to, to work in and try to change it and try it out on ourselves. So as we speak, we're actually doing that in, in Elemult and in other places in the world. And I think, you know, the differences between a workspace and a home is becoming less and less. So uh, we're trying to do, you know, there is an aesthetics and thinking around things for official use, which has been there for years and years. I would like to challenge that for the future. Is there another question, maybe? Yeah, I see a hand over there. That's <laughs> Kim Collin, one of our speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I just wondered if, if because of this new conception of you looking at living uh, in total and less boundaries between live and work or indoor and outdoor or private and public, etc., have you thought about reorganizing the stores? Because currently the stores are organized by room. And I just wondered if you thought of that as a spatial experience, how that, is that considered a possibility of a, an area for change as well? I think it's uh, one of the areas that we have to change uh, quite fast also, actually, to reflect people's living situations. It's maybe something that we have to catch up on. What we're doing right now is not just repurposing our stores, it's actually trying different formats also, like smaller pop-up stores coming inside of the cities. The, uh, the concept of IKEA was uh, you know, conceived in a time when people were taking cars and going outside of the cities. Nowadays, people are staying inside of the cities and uh, they don't even have driver's licenses anymore. So how do we relate to that? And on top of that, you know, what do you meet when you come inside of it? So I think absolutely this is one of the things that we're looking into. Super interesting territory. Thank you. Another question, maybe? We have time for one, one question for sure. Anybody? No? I see a hand up, all the way up. Yeah, it's coming. The microphone is coming. <coughs> um, expanding on that point you just mentioned about pop-up stores and giving experiences to people, you know, that are in s central living and urban environments. Um, I imagine you're looking at more like uh, ways to experience or. To pre-experience through augmented reality or, or virtual reality, how are you sort of exploring that as well to experience before sort of engaging with your products? Actually, we launched a, an app right now together with Apple that we have developed, which is about augmented reality and how you could you could try out our things inside of your home before you even buy it and furnish it in an augmented reality way. So we're on to that too. Uh, your question there is is. Uh, you know, how, how do we develop this for the future? For us, it's, it's on one hand, it's an experience center. On the other hand, it should be an efficient way of actually getting hold of the things that you love from out of IKEA. So that's, that's the two things of retailing. So we have to work with both and actually. And uh, what's happened now in terms of the experience part, yeah, we look into different experiences. The efficiency, we have to rethink the efficiency because that was built upon how we worked with the catalog before. Now you make your choices online instead and in different ways of making that online. So then we have to prepare your buys online in a different way. So we, lot, we work a lot with both those experiences and try to make them seamless for the future. Thank you very much. Maybe one last question. If there is no question, I had one. We are actually here sitting in front of uh, many future designers and designers. How do you attract them at IKEA? these new generation of designers? I think the, the, uh, the most important part for us is to be, is, is not how you get people to come to IKEA, it's how IKEA could come to schools and meet people. So what we try to do is actually to be out there and to do workshops and do work together with great design schools all around the world. That's right. how we do it. Well, that's why we're here today. So thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you. Please, ladies and gentlemen.